molecular mimicry, food security, and seaweed. What on earth do these have in common? When you hear the word mimicry, you might picture something like this. <laughs> I heard that. Um, this is uh, a textbook example where the non-poisonous king snake mimics or imitates the appearance of the poisonous coral snake. You can clearly see here in this drawing which that I did with my nine-year-old which snake is the dangerous one. But it may not be so obvious if you were to meet them in nature. The definition of mimicry is the ability of an organism to copy traits from an unrelated organism in order to gain some sort of advantage. In the example with the snakes, the king snake benefits because predators will think it's dangerous and will avoid it. Given I am a phycologist, which means I like algae, and my favorite um, topic is seaweed, uh, a marine example would be the cleaner fish and its predatory mimic. The cleaner fish is a small fish that forms symbiotic relationships with larger reef fishes and man cleaner station, uh, where this larger fish come in and hang still in the water column, allowing this small cleaner fish to come in and eat parasites from their skin and from their gills, and even inside their mouths without trying to eat it. This is a win-win situation where the cleaner fish gets a home delivered buffet and the larger fish, they get improved oral hygiene. The um, predatory mimic, on the other hand, looks and behaves just like the cleaner fish, but instead of eating parasites, it will nip chunks of tissue off the larger fish. So here the mimic benefits because the larger fish, its prey, believe that it's actually harmless. But let's return to the land and to plants specifically. Just like these previous examples have developed over evolutionary timescales, so has the arms race between plants and the pathogens that attack them. It's like advanced chemical warfare at the molecular level, where the shape and interactions, just like a lock and key of biomolecules, has driven the development of complex sensory messaging and defense systems in plants. These defense mechanisms, they occur both on the plant cell surface and inside the cells. On the plant surface, receptors detect specific elicitor molecules. Remember that lock and key. And these elicitor molecules, they can come from either the pathogen or from damaged plant tissue caused by pathogen activity. The detection of these elicitor molecules kickstarts the plant's defense system uh, in order to halt the spread and colonization by the pathogen. The pathogen, in turn, will respond by releasing so-called effector molecules, and these are designed to hijack the plant's chemical defenses in order to gain access to inside the cells. If this happens, the plant's final uh, line of defense includes localized chemical bleaching and cell death in order to take that pathogen down with them. Of course, this can backfire if too many cells die. But importantly, plants that have been challenged by pathogens and survived, and where these elicitor molecules have been detected, they are now more resistant to future attacks by pathogens, just like having an inoculation. Now, unfortunately, Pathogens and diseases that they cause are a major threat to food security. A New Zealand example of this would be PSA, a bacterial pathogen that devastated the New Zealand kiwi fruit industry when it first emerged. Similar pathogens and their diseases uh, affect important crops globally. In order to stop and to treat these pathogens and their diseases, a range of synthetic chemicals are used. And often these are based on heavy metals like copper or antibiotics. And this might sound a little precarious, but these chemicals are really important. Without them, we could lose up to 50% of the harvest every year. 
that is 50%, half of the fruit and vegetables produced lost or inedible due to disease. So not using these chemicals might mean doubling the cost at the supermarket checkouts or halving the number of families who can afford to buy um, fruit and vegetables. But still, there are concerns around both environmental and human health impacts from the use of these chemicals. And a lot of pathogens are developing resistance to these chemicals as well, which means that they are getting less and less effective. And so there are lots of strong drivers for developing novel, lower impact alternatives um, to protect our food security. And so let's talk about a solution. <coughs> and it's time to return to the sea and my favorite topic, seaweed, like I promised. And so I've heard that not everyone is as excited about seaweed as I am, but perhaps <laughs> after this talk, uh, I will have converted a few of you. Because seaweed are gorgeous and, and really fascinating and also very useful. So because we people, we like to sort and group things into little boxes, we typically sort seaweed based on their pigmentation into red, green and brown. And we often talk about them as if they are a homogenous group and as if they are similar to land plants, which in fact they are not. Um, seaweed lack all the defining features of terrestrial plants, so they don't have true roots or stems or leaves or flowers or fruit. And although green seaweed are reasonably closely related to land plants on the evolutionary tree of life, brown seaweed, they belong to a completely different biological kingdom. And so, in a way, green seaweed and brown seaweed, they are as different to each other as a salmon is to a jellyfish. A lot of people recognize their seaweed mostly from seaweed salad or um, the nori that holds your sushi together. But the main component of seaweed and the main commercial product are their polysaccharides or their complex sugars. These sugars are things like agar and alginate and carrageenan, and they are used as emulsifiers and texturizers and binders in all sorts of things, from textile printing to gastric acid reflux control or in meat canning processing or as an ingredient in ice cream and dessert puddings, or your shampoo and toothpaste. We get the seaweed for all these products through farming. In fact, seaweed farming is a multi-billion dollar global industry. And here in New Zealand, we have one of the largest economic ex exclusive zones in the world and over a thousand species of seaweed. And many of these are completely unique to New Zealand and don't grow anywhere else in the world. And so we have so much potential. Uh, but we are quite late to the party and uh, our seaweed farming industry can only really be described as emerging. And so this is where my team and I come in. A few years ago, I was given the opportunity to come to New Zealand and lead a research team here at the University of Waikato with the ambitious goal of propelling us to the front line of this, um, of this industry. No pressure. <laughs> um, and while we may not be global leaders yet, we do farm some pretty cool seaweed. And so I will show you a video of um, some seaweed that we grow, this is from inside one of the ponds um, at our pilot facility at the university. And this seaweed is called Olva. It's very pretty. It's my favorite. Um, and uh, it's also very useful. And this brings us back to those sugars. So just as fascinating as all those daily use products that require seaweed sugars is that some of these sugars are in fact similar in shape to those lock and key shapes I spoke of earlier, those illicit compounds that kickstart uh, the plant's natural defense to threat. And so this brings us back to the very beginning, that concept of molecular mimicry. So here we have an opportunity to use seaweed sugars to mimic the plant's natural response to threat, and in doing so, start to elicit those plant defense mechanisms without exposing the plant to actual disease. 
And if you remember, these elicited products, they work as an inoculation for the plant, so they are more resistant to future attacks by pathogens. And this means that we will be able to use less of those potentially harmful chemicals that are needed for treating disease. So, in my team, we have extracted a specific sugar called Olven from this seaweed that we have farmed at scale and apply this to a range of crops in glasshouse trials, including tomato and kiwi fruit, with really promising results. We have shown that our olvens prevent disease at low application rates, and that olvens with different shapes have different activity. Now, this is great news, because it means we can use that information to modify these shapes further, and improve that molecular mimicry and drive uh, activity up and make them better. We are in the early stages of this research and there are a few pieces of the puzzle left, uh, but it's super exciting. If we can demonstrate that our results translate well to the field, we will have a New Zealand farmed and produced seaweed elicited product that can, be, that can pass organic labeling and provide a novel, gentler tool in the toolbox to protect our food security. The implications of not doing something like this is, and, and keeping to the status quo includes continuing to spray heavy metals and antibiotics on our food with that risk of increasing uh, pathogen resistance to these chemicals and further future losses. So what can you do, you might wonder. Well, if you are in legislation or policy, you can keep seaweed on the agenda. There's a lot you can do to help. If you are a primary producer with access to seawater, you can see the seaweed as your next crop. There are oceans of opportunity here. <laughs> and if you are a horticultural grower, or just have a green thumb, Keep a lookout for New Zealand produced seaweed elicited products in the future to protect your crops. And finally, we only recently got funded to keep going with this research, which is fantastic. And I think this might be just a thing that will put New Zealand seaweed aquaculture on the global picture.